Uh, thanks for coming today on this somewhat gloomy day. I guess uh, you probably didn't have anything else better to do, right? <laughs> I hope. Um, okay, so obviously this is about digestion. First question, has anyone ever had a digestive issue, diarrhea, constipation, <laughs> gas, <laughs> anything? Okay. Um, does anyone have gas now? No, you, you don't have to tell me. Yeah, your neighbor won't be too happy. So yeah, um, we've all had some sort of digestive upset, right? Um, pretty common illness. It's probably one of the most common things people go to their doctors uh, for help. If we go to the drugstore, a lot of the drugs on the shelves take up a lot of space for digestion. So we've all sort of had it at some point um, or another. Um, maybe we have it right now. So we're going to go through um, a bit of an evolution here. I'm going to start just by telling you a bit about uh, symptomatology and what that's all about. Um, we're going to go through uh, some of the basics of digestion, the anatomy, so we can understand exactly what we're working with here. We need to know um, our machine before we learn how to fix it. Then we're going to talk about some of the common digestive ailments and maybe some solutions to finish this up. Um, and we'll just save questions till the end. So I'll go through the whole lecture and then just if you have a question, write it down or just remember it. Okay, so Elizabeth already did uh, the introduction. We'll skip that. Okay, so firstly, we need to ask the question, what is a symptom? And a symptom is a physical or mental feature that is regarded as indicating a condition of disease. So it's really our body telling us something. It's a sign. It's telling us that, hey, something's wrong here. We need to do something about it. And there's really two ways we can look at that. We can look at that as a bad thing, or we can look at it as a good thing, right? Most people look at these symptoms as a bad thing. Oh, I've got this pain. I just want it to go away. And they do whatever they can to, to take it away. Other people, a very small major or minority, look at a symptom and they say, hmm, what does that mean? Maybe my body's trying to tell me something. Maybe I have to do something about that. And they could use it to their advantage. So that's what we do in symptomatology. We look at the symptoms to really see how those could be used to our advantage and how we can figure out what's going on inside the body. So that brings us to the next question. What is symptomatology? Right, because it's a sort of a long, complicated word. And I get asked a lot, what is that? Um, and basically what that is, is a clinical assessment of nutritional and biological imbalances. So um, there's a doctor by the name of Howard Loomis, and he's one of the leaders in enzyme therapy, um, pretty renowned doctor, and he says that there's no new processes in the body. Things are either moving too fast, too slow, or out of order. So there's nothing really new going on. We just need to find out where that imbalance is, what's moving too fast, what's moving too slow, and then put that back in balance. So for example, uh, cancer. Cancer is a prime example of a process that's moving too fast. It's cells that are out of control. They're growing. Eventually, a tumor forms, and then we can detect it, and it's just cells out of control. A situation where things might be moving too slow would be arthritis. For the speed at which we're putting wear and tear on those joints, they're not repairing quick enough. So we're really trying to find out where that imbalance is. Is it moving too fast or is it moving too slow? Now, picture this. How many of you uh, came in a, some sort of vehicle uh, today? Yeah, so pretty much all of you, right? Not many people biking on a day like today. Well, say you're driving along and you, you know, everything's going good, you're on the way to lecture, you're, you're, you know, you're on time, um, all of a sudden your service engine light comes on and it starts flashing. Well, you've got a number of options here. One, you can pull over, slow down the car, take a second, you know, try to figure out what's going on, maybe look under the hood, um, maybe you figure out, maybe you don't. If you don't, maybe you call CAA. They come, they look under the hood, they're trained professionals at this to when there's a malfunction. And maybe they can figure out what's going on. Another option is that check engine light uh, comes on and you, you think, 
well, I've got to get to where I need to go. So I'm just going to put the pedal to the metal and try to get there as fast as I can. Has anyone ever done that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely seen how far I could go where the gas light's on. Um, and maybe you make it, maybe you don't, right? But you take the risk. Another option is maybe you just put a little bit less wear and tear on the car. You kind of go right at the speed limit. And maybe if I don't put too much gas into it, I'll make it there on time. Or another option is we take it to the mechanic, right? We just go straight there. I, I want to get this fixed. This light's coming on. It's telling me something. I want to know what it is. And then the final option is, of course, you keep that you know, repair kit in, the, in your back seat all the time with the hammer in there. You go, you grab the hammer, and you smash it, and the light goes away. <coughs> Problem goes away, right? Yeah, so you don't have to deal with that anymore. Now, it's the same thing in our body, right? We get a symptom. Symptom is our body. It's our body's language, right? Our body has a language, and it's called symptom-ish, uh, right? And, and it's trying to tell us something. So if we look at those different symptoms, we can try to figure out what is going on inside our body. Now, a lot of the time, People get the symptom, and as I said, some people think it's a, a terrible thing. So they go to the drugstore, and they say, oh, well, I've got this headache. Maybe I'll just take a Tylenol, um, because that'll just take away the pain. But what they're doing is they're just suppressing the symptom. They're not really getting to the underlying cause. Why is that headache happening? We can get headaches from dehydration. We can get it from stress. We can get it from being overtired. There's so many different things we can get a headache from, but we just take that Tylenol, like it's a Tylenol deficiency, and we just take it and it, it magically goes away. But these symptoms are trying to tell us something, so that's what we want to listen to. Now, in our system that we have today, a lot of the symptoms that we go and try to get uh, looked at, don't really, they're not really noticed, right? They're kind of pushed to the side. They're not, really, we're not, they're not really looking at the underlying cause. They're really looking just to, to band-aid the, the, uh, the symptom. Now, this is something I call the slope of health. And this is just, I, I, I show every client this. I show every class this. And it's very important to understand that we build health and we also build disease. It doesn't just happen like that, right? All of a sudden, you're diagnosed with something, and it's there. So it's a progression, it's a continuum. Now, I'm going to just go through it briefly with you. If you look at the bottom side of our slope of health, I call it a slope because it's very easy to go down the slope, not so easy to come back up. On the bottom side, we have various lifestyle decisions and factors. Hereditary, heredity, we, we can't really choose our parents, right? No one chose their parents here. So we get a certain set of genes from our, or well, half of our genes from our father, half of the genes from our mother. We have no control over that. Each set has their weaknesses. Each set has their strengths. Now, whether those strengths or weaknesses are expressed is a whole other can of worms, right? So if we have a poor diet and lifestyle, that's going to maybe bring out some of the weaker genes and pull us further down the slope of health. That might lead to certain vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So that's going to pull further down the slope of health. Then if we have certain chemicals in our environment, chemicals which didn't even exist hundreds of years ago, right? even 100 years ago, a lot of these chemicals, it can exacerbate some of those symptoms. Some we can control, like pesticides, herbicides, the stuff in our food, um, even lots of stuff we put on our body, right? We can control what we put on our body and what we use on our body. Some we can control, like smog, right? Summer's coming, hopefully, at some point. And we get these very smoggy days. We really can't do much about it except um, treat what's happening to our body because of it. So we try to control it as much as we can. But if those are in our environment, it pulls us further down the slope of health until we can get, actually get to a point where in, we're intoxicating our own body from the inside out, right? Due to, our, due to poor digestion, and that'll bring us even further. On the other side of the slope, it's more of the effect. And how do we measure the effect? Usually through medical testing. So at the top, we might have an energetic or biochemical imbalance. We might get a blood test, right? At a certain age, it becomes routine as part of the checkup. You go to the doctor, you get a checkup, they give you a blood test. 
Now, our blood is the river of our body, right? It brings nutrients to the cells and it takes toxins away. It's a very, very important tissue. In fact, it's a tissue. And it wants to stay as homeostatic as possible, which means as constant as possible. It's got a very narrow pH. Our urine can all, uh, change in pH from about a 5 to an 8, just throughout the day, back and forth. Our blood needs to stay between 7.35 and 7.45. So it's in the decimal places. If we dip too high or too low, I'm on the ground. I'm in a coma. So it's the river of body needs to stay very constant. We'll do anything. We'll take stuff from our tissues to, to maintain that pH, for example. It'll, it'll strip minerals from the bones, osteoporosis, right? And it'll take stuff from the tissues at the expense to uh, serve the blood. Now, blood test might come back normal not the best indication of what's going on in the body. We might get a sign or a symptom of pain, some fatigue, uh, maybe some digestive upset. So we go to the doctor and, or we self-medicate this time, and we go and get an over-the-counter drug, a shopper's drug mart, right? So symptoms go away, that's nice. But the symptoms come back maybe even worse or there's more. So we go back to the doctor. The doctor says, well, this group of symptoms is this disease and they give you something called a diagnosis. Now they have a name for it. Now, now that they have a name, they could go to a book. They can open up to a page on the book and there's what's known as a protocol. So it's a drug, it's a surgery, it's something stronger. So you might go get uh, a prescription medication, you might get a cutout or some surgery or something even more drastic and that brings you further down the slope of health. So we want to understand that each one of us are at a different level on the slope of health and we can, we can go up, we can go down, but it's a matter of building it either way. We build disease and we build health. Now what's interesting and what I work with are specific nutrients because, you know, that's what builds us, right? Vitamins, minerals, this is what fuels our body. Now botanists know this very well, right? If you look at this plant up here, we can see that when certain minerals are deficient in this plant, it shows certain symptoms, right? The color of the leaf is just a symptom. So you can see um, second from the bottom on the left there is magnesium. Magnesium, when it's deficient in this plant, the leaves are, are almost like a white color, right? And if you were, if you were the, um, the grower of this plant, you might say, what does this plant need? Hmm. And you most likely wouldn't go to a, a drugstore and throw some drugs in the soil, right, to try to remedy it. You'd say, well, we need uh, some sort of mineral. It must be missing something from the soil, right? The soil must not be fertile enough. And you can see there's many, many different others. So brings us to a question, what are we made of? And if we look here at the elemental composition of the human body, we're just made of minerals. We're mostly made of oxygen, right? We breathe in and all the time, so we're actually made a, a lot out of it. Uh, carbon and hydrogen definitely take the cake on that one. And then we're made up of all these other minerals. So if I took all the water out of you and just, you know, dried you out and crushed you down and analyzed you, you'd just be a bunch of minerals. So when one of those are missing, certain parts of the body don't work properly. Now another thing um, I'd like to mention at this point as well is that the body and the body systems work on a hierarchy. So different tissues, different systems, different functions have different priorities in the body. What is the most important organ of the body? Brain. Someone says a brain here. Well, if we don't have our brain, we could still live quite, quite well, right? We might not be very, uh, highly functioning individuals heart. in society. Heart, absolutely. The heart starts before we're born and doesn't stop till we're finished, right? If it stops, then it's not a good situation. So our body needs to, it will, will take all nutrients, everything for the heart. But that's just one example. It has a whole hierarchy. It'll, it'll steal from one to give to another. Now, specific nutrients are gonna have specific symptoms. And we, we discovered this a few hundred years ago um, when sailors went out to sea. <laughs> Just an anonymous sailor up there that, that we don't know. 
about 300 years old, this picture, um, would go out to sea. And a lot of them started to get very sick on these long voyages. So um, they, were, you know, they tried everything. They tried different foods and everything. Finally, they, they discovered that when they gave these sailors limes, their symptoms would go away. What were the symptoms? Bloody gums. Uh, teeth would fall out, their tissues wouldn't heal properly, their tissues would lose their elasticity, eventually they just bleed out and die. And when they gave them uh, limes, for example, their symptoms went away miraculously, which is one of the reasons why sailors are also called limeys. Mm -hmm. So what they discovered um, not too long after that was there's a certain component in limes known as vitamin C. Has anyone heard of vitamin C? <laughs> No? OK, well, that's a couple of yeses, a couple of noes. We've all heard of vitamin C. So vitamin C was associated with this disease process called scurvy. Um, not as common anymore these days, but uh, people still do get it. So they gave them limes. They'd be fine on these long trips, and, and it was all good. Now, with modern technology and modern nutraceuticals, as they're sometimes called, um, if they had vitamin C at that time in a capsule, they would just take it, right? Um, it'd be a much more concentrated form of vitamin C, and it'd be a lot easier to use. And that's what technology has brought us up to at this point. So sometimes when we're working with therapeutic supplements, we can um, basically concentrate the food down into very uh, high amounts. And even if we want to take it a step further, as a nutritionist, I'm not able to do this, but naturopaths are able to do this, and even doctors. We can just give it intravenously. Skip the whole digestive tract, which we're going to get into in a moment, um, and just give it right into the bloodstream, which is always a very effective way to take something, but not available to everyone. OK, so let's um, get into digestion. First, we're going to just look at the anatomy briefly because we need to understand what we're working with. Before a mechanic works on a car, they got to understand all the different parts. So we're going to look at four main parts of the digestive tract, really simplify it here. Obviously, we're starting with the mouth, right? We chew our food with the mouth. Everyone knows where the mouth is. Um, some people know a little too well where the mouth is. Um, then we have the stomach, holds our food. It's the first holding vessel for our food. It sits there, it digests, and then it's going to move on to the small intestine. And the small intestine is 21 feet long, right, sitting in the stomach. Now, when, um, when I leave my home in the morning, there's two things that I never forget. Actually, three. My keys, if I'm driving, my wallet, and my small intestine. <laughs> <laughs> Never leave home without this. So, I mean, it's one thing to, um, to hear 21 feet. Can you just hold my sure. small intestine in there, please? <laughs> it's another thing to see it, really. I mean, this thing just keeps on going. Yeah, I'm going to pass some of my intestine back there. Everyone's got to get a piece. Yeah, you can just grab the middle there. So just hold that up for us for a sec. So that's a small intestine. Not too small, is it? It's called the small, you, you can put it down now. <laughs> it's called the small intestine because of the diameter, not because of the length. The large intestine is a lot larger in diameter, but a lot shorter in length. Is this a and this? it's about the diameter, maybe a little thicker. But the, um, this, the name of the game when it comes to the small intestine is absorption. It's where we absorb all of our food, pretty much. So it needs to be long. It needs to have a huge surface area. And on the surface of our small intestine, which, is, which fits right in my stomach like that, all rolled up, are these villi that kind of look like a shag carpet. And if we laid that out, it would basically be the surface area of a tennis court. So that's what our, foods, that's what our body's being exposed to when we eat a certain food. Then the next step is the large intestine. And that's the final resting station before we go to the office, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and that's also a very important part of the digestive process. It's where we scavenge a lot of water. right? It's where um, there's this motion called peristalsis, 
where it kind of moves our food along, like squeezing a tube of toothpaste. And that's one of the main places for us to scavenge water from our digestive tract. Now, as you can see on the board, and you all have diagrams on the handouts I gave you, you can look at. If you didn't get a sheet, I'll give it to you after. Is the large intestine is basically like an upside down U. Right? It's an upside down U. This is the sigmoid. And pretty much until halfway across the transverse colon, our, our digestive material in there is liquid. And our body's just scavenging the liquid, and then it be starts to become solid, and then we're ready to evacuate. Um, now, uh, one condition pe some people get is called diarrhea, right? A big problem in more of the developing countries, and people can actually die from it. The main reason they die from it is from dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Okay, so very important for absorbing the water from our digestive tract. So that's a bit of the anatomy. We understand now that the mouth goes to the stomach, connects to the small intestine, connects to the large intestine. I think there was a, a song that sort of sounded like that once upon a time when I was a kid. Okay, what affects digestion? <coughs> Chewing. Most of us don't chew enough. Right? It's something so many people forget. It's our first chance to actually break down the food that we're consuming physically, right? Mechanically. Every step after that uses chemicals in some way. So the more we can break it down in our mouth and chew the food, the more surface area we allow for the different enzymes and digestive juices to act on the food. So sometimes someone could improve their digestion substantially just by chewing their food more. They feel better, they feel more energized, their digestive tract's doing less work, and they're doing more of the work up here in their mouth. So chewing is very important. There was a, a, a doctor who ran uh, this, this sanitarium where he was healing a lot of people. And one of his uh, mandates, his name was Fletcher, was called Fletcherizing. And they had to chew at least 100 times per mouthful, right? Which is quite a bit. Just think about it. Next time you're eating a meal, how many 100 times is? The idea is you want to get it to about a peanut butter consistency. Right? You want to almost drink your food, is another <laughs> saying. Right? Drink your food and eat your liquids. Food. Food can affect digestion. The foods that we choose can actually affect the way our digestive tract works. So um, live foods, like fresh foods that have lots of enzymes and lots of life to them, like an apple, a lot easier to digest than something that's been processed, like maybe a white piece of bread that doesn't have a lot of the nutrients left in it. Whatever is not in our food, our digestive tract and body is going to have to make up for. Allergies. Allergies are rampant, and they're getting even more and more rampant in our culture. If we're allergic to a certain food, there's going to be an inflammatory response when we eat that food the next time. Right? So some people are allergic to gluten or wheat. Gluten is a protein in wheat. Whenever they eat that, they have a very immense allergic reaction. There's a disease called celiac disease. They can't consume any gluten, or else there's a very strong immune reaction towards that food. And um, that's going to definitely affect digestion, a lot of digestive upset there. Sensitivities. Sometimes. Someone might not have an allergy, an immune response, but they might be sensitive to a certain food. Okay, so their immune system isn't reacting, but when they eat that food, they just feel maybe a little lethargic. Maybe they get diarrhea. Maybe they um, are sensitive to dairy and have a bit of lactose intolerance. Right, so that's going to affect digestion as well. Stress. Stress affects digestion quite a bit. We're going to get into this in a bit more detail and also medications, okay? Medications have these things called side effects. Has anyone heard of those? Yes. They should be really be called effects, right? Because that's what the medication does. So it's just different for every person. Now, medications have a wide variety of side effects, but many of them have effects on our digestive tract, as you know. For example, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs like Tylenol, aspirin, acetaminophen, 
one of the problems with them is if you take them chronically, it, it could actually cause gastric bleeding or bleeding in the stomach over a period of time. That's not too good for digestion. Um, and then others uh, might have an effect on appetite. Antidepressants, for example have all sorts of um, digestive side effects. Digest in, in the list of side effects, digestion comes number one, and it's nausea for uh, antidepressants. OK, so essentially, when we're digesting, we want to convert the soil, the plant stuff that grows in that soil, into our cells. You've all heard the saying, you are what you eat. Well, this is 100% true, right? Literally, what I ate in the past seven years is what's standing before you right now. <laughs> I'm basically seven years old. I might seem a little older, but I'm basically <laughs> seven years old. So we replenish all of our cells in about seven years. Different cells replenish at different speeds. For example, digestive tract replaces itself every three to five days. Pretty quick. Our nervous system takes a bit longer. Our bones about a year, right? So each tissue has a, a, a certain turnover time. But what's happening in that turnover? Well, we're replacing the cells with new cells. Where are we getting those new cells? Well, we're building them out of the food we eat. So whatever food we eat, we're going to build that new set, those new set of cells with. So the second you start eating properly, that's when you start healing. So the next meal. The next meal you have, you can start the healing process. You can start building the, that, that new generation of cells and really uh, building the strength of your body up. But digestion isn't the only part of the equation here. Digestion is one part, and that's the breakdown of food stuff into progressively smaller units. That's all it is. We're taking that apple. We're first breaking it down in our mouth. Then it's going smaller and smaller into single units, and then we're absorbing it. That's all digestion is large to small. But that's not the full story. Next, we have to absorb it. We have to absorb our food across the small intestine, which we saw isn't that small. Right? It's very long, big surface area. And that small intestine has a membrane. It's called a semi-permeable membrane. Why is it called semi-permeable? Because some things can go through, other things can't. Kind of like the screen door at your home. Let's all the nice fresh air in, but keeps out all the big flies. Right? So it only lets the very sm small particles through. And if we're not absorbing that food, that delicious, healthy food we just ate, it's useless to us. So we have to absorb it after that. Next, we have to assimilate it. Just like the picture shows, we need to convert the food into our own cells, which is called assimilation, which would be a, a process more at a cellular level. And then, just like any good factory, right? they, ha they make the product, and then they always have waste. And that's where we have elimination. And that's when we're removing metabolic waste and byproducts from the body. Now, the obvious route of elimination here is um, through the bowel, right? That's one of the channels of elimination, through the large intestine. Another channel of elimination is through our urine, right? Those are the two obvious ones. A third channel of elimination is our lungs, right? I'm breathing. If I hold my breath, it's not going to be a good situation. I'm going to have to breathe at some point because my body is detoxifying <coughs> carbon dioxide. It wants to get rid of it. It wants to eliminate it. I also get rid of other stuff uh, through my breath. If you've ever had garlic, that's one of the ways we detoxify garlic, through the breath, right? Some people get very bad breath when they consume garlic and onions as well. So lungs. The fourth <coughs> channel of elimination is done through the largest organ in our body, our skin which a lot of people forget as well. And our skin gets rid of about two pounds of waste per day. So very important to keep the skin free of chemicals, lotions. Whatever we put on our skin, we're basically eating because it can go either way. It gets absorbed right into the blood. So any makeups, lotions, perfumes, um, sanitizers, soaps that we put on our hands or body or face, 
goes into our bloodstream. But it also goes the other way. It detoxifies a lot of uh, chemicals. So uh, sweating is a wonderful way to detoxify and eliminate a lot of those things out of our body. Saunas, dry saunas, infrared saunas, anything like that is, is a great way. So we've got these four channels of elimination. We're going to be mostly talking about the digestive tract as the channel of elimination. So let's get into some common digestive issues. We obviously don't have time to go through all of them. Um, so I've chosen some of the more common digestive issues. We're going to talk about constipation. Not something you talk about every day. Well, for me it is. <laughs> Irritable bowel syndrome and heartburn. Heartburn is rampant. So firstly, what is constipation? Infrequent or incomplete bowel movements often characterized by stools that are hard, dry, and difficult to pass due to slow transit time. So infrequent, incomplete, they're dry. Remember what's happening here? We're scavenging water. So if someone's constipated, constipated, they're constantly squeezing the water out of their stool and absorbing that. It's not the most beautiful picture. And slow transit time. What does transit time mean? It's the speed at which food travels through your digestive tract. So how long it takes from the time you eat the food to the time you eliminate it. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about um, one of the main reasons why people get constipated, and that's fiber. Fiber and transit time, actually, which are both related. Now, East Africans eat about 100 grams of fiber per day. Their transit time is about 18 to 24 hours. So throughout a day, you know, you have breakfast. The next day when you have breakfast, you eliminate yesterday's breakfast. It's all good. One, one, in, in with one, out with the other. And they've got very low rates of diseases that we have here in North America. There was a doctor by the name of Dennis Burkett. Um, he was a British uh, surgeon in the 70s, which studied a lot of African tribes. And this is one of the things he discovered. He discovered that they consumed huge amounts of fiber and had almost no digestive cancers and many of the degenerative diseases of the Western world, which was a, a, a huge discovery at the time. Now, what do we eat? 25 grams of fiber, so about a fourth is the average. So if some people eat less, some people eat more. That leads to 72 hours of transit time. That's over three days, right? So. If you've ever left your garbage in the garage, right, and you forgot to take it out that week, um, you know what happens, right? It starts to stink. And if you left that there even longer, it would probably start to come into the house or apartment or wherever you live, right? And so on and so on. So same thing's happening in our digestive tract. If we're holding on to extra stool, then that's getting reabsorbed back into our body, and then we actually have to detoxify that and work extra hard at getting rid of those toxins. And it could actually get so bad where you reach a state of what's known as auto-intoxication, intoxicating yourself, which is why transit time is so important. And that can cause any number of symptoms, depending on who you are and where your weaknesses are. So what else causes constipation? We saw insufficient fiber causes constip constipation, sometimes um, related to the standard American diet, also known as the SAD diet. Lack of exercise. Right? Exercise helps us digest properly. We have muscles all around our digestive tract. In fact, our digestive tract is a muscle. So if we exercise, we help tone the muscles around the digestive tract, and it actually helps with elimination. One of the things people do when they're constipated is they, they, they contract their abdominals very strongly. And that's because they're trying to push against the large intestine so it can push the stool out. 
This needs something to push against. So exercise, very important. Pregnancy. When, um, when someone's pregnant, that baby is taking up a huge amount of space in there, right? It's just pushing everything out of the way. So it's also going to squeeze that a little bit and make things a little tighter and not allow things to pass as easily right through. Excessive use of laxatives. So someone gets constipated, they go to the drugstore, they get a laxative, it relieves them, everything's all good. But in a few days, they're backed up again and they continue the cycle over and over. This muscle, this is just a big muscle, is going to start to get weak. Just like if I put my arm in a sling and just left it there for six weeks, what's going to happen? It's going to atrophy. My muscle's just going to get smaller and smaller because I'm not using it. That's what happens with laxatives. You're not allowing the bowel to do what it needs to do, and the muscles are getting weak. So they can become uh, addictive and they can cause constipation, even though that's what you're trying to treat. <laughs> Ignoring the urge to defecate, <laughs> right? There's always that one public bathroom that you don't want to go to, and you'll hold it in no matter what. Um, Sometimes uh, I've been on a, a couple camping trips with a bunch of people. There was a trip I was leading um, out of Banff a number of years ago, and it was a five-day camping trip. And we're in the outback, and you have to basically go in a hole. There's no toilets. And some people just refuse to go to the bathroom, right? And what happens is they get what's known as backlogged. They just keep on piling up and piling up, and that just constipates the hell out of them, right? And sometimes they have trouble when they get back home actually getting all that out. So not a good situation to ignore the urge. Dehydration. So the large intestine, the colon, one of its main purposes is to scavenge water. But if we're not consuming water in the first place, we're going to really not have enough water in our stool because we still need a little bit of water in the stool to, to give it some good consistency to allow for elimination. If we don't have enough water in our body, we're going to scavenge from here, and it's going to get harder and harder and harder and then it's just going to get stuck like a big rock, right? So we need to make sure we're drinking a lot of water. Stress. Stress has different effects on everyone. So some people it constipates, some people it causes diarrhea, right? It really depends who you are. But depending on how um, it reacts in your body, it, it's, it's a possible cause. And magnesium deficiency. Magnesium is the anti-stress mineral. If you feel tension, if you feel tight, your muscles are always tense, you're always kind of like this, um, try some magnesium. It helps relax the muscle. It's very important for the relaxing of the muscle fibers. Now, the large intestine is one big muscle, as I said. It's a smooth muscle is what it's called. So if we don't have enough magnesium, it might always be tension intention, right? And if we get some magnesium in there, it could actually help relax the bowel and help you eliminate a lot better. And in fact, some strong laxatives um, use magnesium at very high dosages to help eliminate everything that's in there. And that's one of um, the effects. If you take too much magnesium, you can actually get a little bit of diarrhea, which isn't a big problem. It's just a little sign that you're consuming too much. and also insufficient stomach acid. So stomach acid is the, basically the beginning of what's known as the digestive cascade. So everything after that step of creating stomach acid is going to affect the digestive process. And this is also a very big problem and also a cause of indigestion. A lot of people think it's too much stomach acid because they feel that acid at the back of their throat, but it's actually not enough stomach acid. And what do uh, they get prescribed most of the time? Antacids, which just make the problem even worse. Okay, so we're going to move on to irritable bowel syndrome, which is another very common complaint of the digestive tract. 
In fact, it's very commonly diagnosed these days. Um, there's a lot more symptoms that they've grouped under irritable bowel syndrome. So it's diagnosed all the time. Okay, so it's by far one of the most common gastrointestinal complaints. IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And it's known as a functional bowel disease. What does that mean exactly? Well, if someone is diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome and you actually went into the digestive tract and took a look around with a scope, you're not going to see any lesions. You're not going to see any damage, any inflammation. There's nothing there in the tissue that tells us something is wrong. It's purely through the symptomatology. And if you remember back to the slope of health, right, how health is a continuum, IBS we could think about being a little bit higher on the continuum. And then more lesional diseases like Crohn's and colitis and various uh, digestive illnesses where there's actually lesions would be further down the slope of health. And often people who do have these lesional conditions have some sort of IBS at some, some point along the way before that actually happens. What causes IBS? Multifactorial, has, as you see, is the, is the situation most of the time. Food sensitivities, again, we see food sensitivities. So remember, it's an irritated bowel. If you're sensitive to lactose and milk, you're going to have diarrhea all the time, every time you consume it. Right? Um, if you don't have the enzyme lactase, to digest lactose, what happens is a large amount of water gets pulled into your digestive tract and then you get diarrhea. Lactose intolerance. 70% um, of the population on this planet can't digest dairy after they're weaned. But in North America, we think milk is an important part of the daily diet. <coughs> Not only that, but it takes up quite a large place on the Canada Food Guide. And we know that the Canada Food Guide is for all of Canada, and Canada is multicultural. And certain um, cultures have less ability to digest dairy, like uh, from the Asian part of the world. right? So they have a lot less ability to digest dairy. Um, if you can digest dairy, you're a mutant. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm telling you. You have a mutation in your gene that has allowed you to digest dairy after you've been weaned. So we think not able to digest dairy is, is, is the minority. But we're actually the abnormal people who can digest dairy. Mutants. Infection. And I'm not talking about um, like the infection that we might get on our skin. You know, you cut yourself, you don't take care of it properly, it gets a little red, maybe a little pussy if it gets too far down the road. But I'm talking about more low grades infections. And in our gut, we have a huge amount of bacteria, huge amount of bacteria. And that needs to be in balance. We have good bacteria or beneficial bacteria that work for us, about 85% of the population. We have not so good bacteria, which is about 15%. But if they're kept in check, it's fine. They get along, kind of like, you know, out there, we have a certain amount of uh, criminals. We have a certain amount of good guys. As long as the criminals are kept in check, there's no chaos. But once that reverses, if there was 85% bad guys out there, we'd be in big trouble, right? So we want to keep a good balance, and that could be a low-grade infection when we have an imbalance of those bacteria. Malabsorption. Remember, we digest our food, then we have to absorb it. If there's any sort of inflammation or problems with our digestive tract, we might not be able to absorb that. It's called malabsorption. We're not getting the nutrients we consume. AIDS, right? Um, they have quite a bit of problems with actually digesting their food and very irritable bowels. And there's a very strong mind-body interaction. In fact, it's so strong that anyone I've ever seen with any digestive issue always has a very high amount of stress. And often, their issues begin where there's a very uh, traumatic, stressful event in their life. So very strong connection between the mind, the body, and the digestive tract. We're going to look at that in a bit more detail in a moment. 
finally, just stress. Now, our body can't tell the difference between different types of stress. It just processes it all the same. Very strong body-mind connection to our digestive tract. The gut has more nerve endings than the spine. Not only that, but it creates 95% of our serotonin. What's serotonin? It's one of the most important neurotransmitters in our brain. It's what the multi-billion industry of antidepressants is based on, this one neurotransmitter. Prozac. Anyone heard of Prozac? That is called a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or SSRI. It stops us from basically reuptaking that serotonin and putting it back into the cell, and it keeps on hitting the receptor, telling us, oh, we feel good, we're happy, we feel good, we're happy, for a certain amount of time. The thing is, 95% of it is made in our gut, yet this is for our brain. So a lot of the time, there's uh, digestive side effects, and that's definitely the most common with these drugs. And we don't actually know the full connection between the brain and the gut. Sometimes it's referred to as the second brain. There's a book on this called The Second Brain, right? It's all about uh, the gut and the, and the brain connection there. Now, it's all good and well to say that our brain is connected to our gut, but how? How is it connected? Let's look at, let's go into a bit more detail here. We have two, two sort of branches of our nervous system. We have a parasympathetic nervous system and a sympathetic nervous system. Our parasympathetic nervous system is what might be uh, fired up when we're sitting on a rock in the middle of a lake meditating. It's our rest and digest mode, our stop and think mode when we're calm, collected, cool. We can think, um, we can relax. And we can't be in, in both at the same time. We're either in one or we're in the other. The other one is called the fight or flight mode or fright mode. And this is the sympathetic nervous system. And this is key for survival. I mean, we need to have both operating in full capacity, but we, we don't want to be in one or the other all the time. So you don't want to be on vacation the rest of your life, right? Well, maybe some of you. But if you're, you know, if you're relaxing all the time, every day, it loses its you know, goodness factor, and you, just, you want to do something with yourself eventually. But you also don't want to be fired up all the time. You also don't want to be like on edge all the time, ready to fight. Now, our biology, is based on biology from thousands of years ago, right? Our genes haven't changed for at least 10,000 years. And it takes about 10,000 years for our genes to, to change by 0 0.01 of a percent, whatever that means. But the point is, our, we don't change that much through evolution. Very small amount. And maybe our, our cavemen ancestors were going out one day um, because they were hungry and this caveman left in the morning, said goodbye to his cave wife and his cave children and grabbed his, <laughs> his spear and joined up with the rest of the clan and went out and they wanted to find themselves, you know, let's say a deer, a good deer to eat that night. They go out and they're going through the bush and they turn around a corner and all of a sudden they see a saber-toothed tiger. Now, they weren't looking for a saber-toothed tiger, but one comes out, and all of a sudden, their sympathetic nervous system gets fired. Their adrenal glands fire these stress hormones into the body, which is a, a very important for survival. What it does is it brings all the blood to the extremities, the hands, the feet. It uh, dilates the pupils so we can see better. It brings um, more blood to certain parts of the brain so we can think faster. Increases heart rate, increases blood pressure. The heart beats a lot quicker, which is all good if we need to fight or run away from a saber-toothed tiger. Now, saber-toothed tiger backs off, they back off, they go get their deer, they do their hunt. Um, they're all excited about their hunt and their sympathetic nervous system was fired then too. But they come back, they settle down, they cut up their deer, they prepare it, 
they all eat it, they talk with their family, they talk about their, their day outside the cave. Um, the cave woman talks with the cave kids and they all gather around, they have a nice relaxing meal and then they enjoy the rest of the day. In fact, most indigenous cultures work about three to four hours a day and the rest of the time they spend with their family playing and just relaxing. So the thing is our body hasn't changed that much and now we have a lot more stressors. We have traffic jams, we have debt, we have jobs that are, you know, are, are really testing us. And our body doesn't know the difference between the saber-toothed tiger and a traffic jam, unfortunately. All stress is the same, physical, emotional, chemical, um, electromagnetic. You could kind of think about a big funnel over your head and it all kind of goes into the same place. Now, when we're in this sympathetic mode, <coughs> We don't need to digest. We don't need to digest when our, life, or when our life is at risk. So if we're always in that sympathetic mode, our digestion, our digestion doesn't get the resources it needs. Has anyone seen that commercial where the taxi drivers drive in and he's you know, pounding back a burger and then he gets indigestion? Well, there's no resources going there, so he just takes his antacid and then all the pain goes away. Right? So we need to be uh, calm and relaxed if we want to digest our food properly. Most of the time we aren't. Now let's take this a step further. Okay? So I've told you about the, the two nervous systems. We want to be in parasympathetic mode in, instead of sympathetic. There was a couple studies carried out. One in the journal Gut, which is a pretty reputable journal. The other was in Gastroenterology, another very reputable journal. And they wanted to see and try to measure if there was an emotional effect on actual physical measures in the body um, and in the gut. And what they found, this is, um, this is a quote from the study, was recent data suggests that physiological stress produces alterations in gastrointestinal inflammation, so in, actually an increase in inflammation, and in bacterial mucosal interaction. So remember we talked about that bacterial balance. We want 85 good, 15% bad. Providing mechanisms to support the relationship between psychological stress and disease activity in specifically IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, which includes colitis and Crohn's. Now, if you looked at the actual studies, um, they looked at different um, things in the blood that represented inflammation, one of them, they looked at free radicals. And a specific type of free radical increased by 475%. So it had, and there was also a, a lot of other measures. But these free radicals, um, have you heard of antioxidants, right? Antioxidants are everywhere in the media, right? You want lots and lots of antioxidants. There's pomegranate juice, blueberry juice, different supplements. And these are all to fight the free radicals. Free radicals are formed in our body. They kind of sound like what they do. They're free and they're radical and they just want to cause damage. It's like these things going around your body with a little hammer and they just want to destroy every tissue they see. So that's what was increased in this study. So very important to relax, de-stress if you want to heal the gut in any way. Finally, we're going to talk about heartburn, a very common um, ailment most people get. And this is just when gastric juices back up into the esophagus. What causes heartburn? Overeating. What would happen if you tried to fill up more gas in your car than there was actually room for in your tank? Start to spill out, right? There's just not enough room. Our stomach is a certain size. Yeah, it can stretch, and it does when we overeat, maybe around the holiday times. But at a certain point, there's too much stuff to fit into such a small space, and it can actually reflux up and cause some heartburn. Now, if we look back at the anatomy for a moment, we've got our esophagus. Our head's up here. That is not to scale, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
we eat the food, goes into our mouth, goes down the esophagus. We've got a sphincter here, and we've got a sphincter here, which blocks off the stomach from different parts. Now, in the stomach area, we've got a very thick mucus layer. And it protects the stomach because the stomach acidity could get down to a 1.5. If I took the juices that were secreted in your stomach and poured it on the outside of your skin, it'd just burn right through, hydrochloric acid. But in the stomach, we need that to digest the food properly. One of the ways it protects itself is by creating a mucous membrane. The esophagus, on the other hand, does not have such a thick mucous <coughs> membrane. So if any contents from the stomach squirt up or get pushed up, it's going to cause that pain and even damage at, in certain situations. So we need to try to keep it all in. And when we overeat, we take up that whole space and some is going to go up into the esophagus and it's going to cause those symptoms of heartburn, people call it. Being overweight. Well, <coughs> pregnancy can cause heartburn just because that baby pushes out everything. But uh, being overweight can also cause heartburn for the same reason. The more weight you have everywhere, not just on the inside, but on the inside, not just on the outside, but on the inside, it's going to decrease the size of the stomach. And it's going to push in every which way and more chance for some of that stomach juice to actually get up into your esophagus. <coughs> stress, again with the stress. Right? We need to be rest and relax so all of our blood, all of our resources could go to the stomach. If we're in sympathetic mode, if we're in fight or flight mode, blood goes to the extremities, no resources for the stomach there to digest. Alcohol. Alcohol can cause uh, heartburn. It messes with digestion. And basically, alcohol is a poison to the body. Peppermint is a bit of a surprising one, right? Because some people drink peppermint tea to ease digestion. Well, if you have very serious reflux, it's something you might want to avoid because peppermint actually relaxes this sphincter known as the cardiac sphincter. It, can, it actually has a muscle relaxing effect. And um, you can sometimes use it if you have muscle tension. People who get migraines from muscle tension up in the neck can rub a peppermint essential oil on that muscle and sometimes relaxes the muscle enough to alleviate the symptom. So it actually helps relax muscles. People with IBS can take peppermint uh, capsules which help relax the digestive tract and don't cause such a contraction. So peppermint actually helps relax, but it could have a negative effect sometimes. Eating too rapidly, I think we're all guilty of this at some point. You know, just scarfing it down, maybe you know, we have to be at an appointment, maybe you know, we're just really hungry. But eating too rapidly, we're just not chewing our food properly, we're not giving our body a chance to digest properly. And certain drugs, like non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, which will actually damage the mucosa, can cause gastric bleeding. So that's definitely going to cause uh, some symptoms. Spicy foods also do cause uh, heartburn. And sugar as well. Sugar just feeds those bad bacteria. And once those bad bacteria proliferate, they can cause fermentation acids. And that can cause a bit of a reflux. Bacteria need to digest and also have gas as a bit of a byproduct. So once we get some gas up here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to force that sphincter open and some of the contents are going to uh, spurt up. So that brings us to preventing digestive issues. How can we prevent these things? Because we don't want all of those symptoms to happen. And prevention, well, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure, as they say. So there's many ways where we can tonify our digestive tract and really assist it in doing what it needs to do and not putting such a big load on it. So a couple points here. These you have all on your handout. One of the best ways to kind of start the digestive tract is first thing in the morning, have a little lemon juice, fresh lemon juice, with some water in a big glass. And that brings the acidity down. We want a nice acidic environment in our digestive tract to help digest the food. 
And it just kind of flushes everything out and wakes everything up. Apple cider vinegar is also a wonderful thing to do. What would be the ratio for that? Um, I'll talk about it after. Yeah, we'll, we'll do questions. Um, smaller meals more often. Right, so we're, you know, we all eat meals that are way too large for our bodies. If we make them a lot smaller and eat them more often, it's a lot less strain on our digestive tract. A lot less resources have to go in. Kind of like the dishwasher at the restaurant. Instead of giving him all the dishes for the whole restaurant one time, we give him a little bit throughout the day, right? And he can deal with the load. Avoid red meat, dairy, convenience foods, and alcohol. Well, red meat, very hard to digest for some people. It's a very concentrated protein. Some people digest it fine. But if you have digestive issues, sometimes it's good to try to eliminate it and see if that improves. A lot of resources are needed to digest that red meat. Same with dairy. Dairy is very alkaline. So our digestive tract needs to pump out a lot of acid to help digest it properly. Convenience foods, they're basically just dead foods. Any gas station has all convenience foods. Right? These are foods all the life force has been taken out. Right? Also, there's lots of energy bars where the life force has been taken out. It's all these foods, but they've been processed and put into this bar form, which is very hard for our body to assimilate. So we want to stay away from those. And then alcohol affects the whole digestive tract. It also has somewhat of a diuretic effect, so it speeds everything up. <coughs> Practice food combining. I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty details of this, but the basic concept is we want to combine um, proteins with basically vegetables, fats with vegetables. We don't want to combine very concentrated sugars like a piece of cake with very concentrated proteins, like a steak, right? So the dessert at the end of the meal. See, kids have it right with having the dessert before the meal. It digests a lot faster, those sugars, and then we can have the proteins, which take a lot longer to digest. Another way we can food combine is by combining um, live foods if we're having cooked foods, okay? So we always want, uh, uh, when I say live foods, I mean fresh foods. We always want a portion of our meal to be a fresh food because there's components in that known as enzymes that are actually going to help digest the cooked food. And in cooked food, there's no enzymes because those get destroyed at higher temperatures. So we can combine those and help digest the food that way. Limit fluid intake with meals. Why do I suggest that? Well, if we're drinking with our meals, we're diluting all of the digestive juices. So the digestive tract has to pump out more and more juices to bring the acidity down and to digest the food properly. So always want to be drinking between meals or at least a half an hour before a meal, okay, to properly just absorb that liquid and to digest your food properly. And want to avoid cold beverages as well because we won't absorb a liquid until it's body temperature, right? So if I drink a really cold beverage, it first has to go body temperature and then I can absorb it. So if I absorb it at room, or if I drink it at room temperature, a lot easily, more easily absorbed. Also, if you've ever jumped into a, a, a pool of cold water or you've taken a cold shower, what, what happens? You start to shiver, right? That's what's gonna happen on the inside and your digestive tract doesn't like that. Avoid eating when rushed, upset, and stressed. And we talked about that when we talked about the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic nervous system and how we want to be in parasympathetic mode when we eat, right? So we want to avoid things like watching the news when we eat, right? Reading the paper when we eat. Having upsetting conversations when we eat. We want to save those till after <laughs> or before. Um, so anything that makes us upset while we're eating or riled up. And at least, uh, eat at least some raw with every meal, as I mentioned. These have live enzymes. These are going to help digest the food. And then to help us along, there's always some supplemental options. So certain supplements we can take, which are going to just give us the extra little bit of help that we need. 
Some supplements you might want to look at. Firstly, are enzymes. Enzymes are these components. They're part of every single cell. They're very important for digestion. And they break down those molecules from bigger to smaller. Remember I told you everything's chemical after we chew our food? Well, the enzymes do this. They're the workers that start breaking down all the different bonds. So we can actually get enzymes in supplement form if we need to help our digestive tract do that. And it's going to digest those foods. Can you taste food with, with the meal. With yeah, for foods. Probiotics. Right? I mentioned that. Um, lots of bacteria in our gut. In fact, we're all more bacteria than we are human. There's more bacterial cells, 10 times more, than human cells in each person. So there's about uh, 1 trillion uh, human cells. There's about 10 trillion bacterial cells. So very important part of our immune system. And the good ones are called probiotics. Pro meaning for, biotic meaning life. You've all heard of antibiotics, which is against life. <laughs> Right? We take these antibiotics, they just kill everything. They kill the good guys and the bad guys. So if you've ever taken antibiotics, you have to replenish those good probiotics. Ginger is a wonderful herb. There's lots of herbs that are great for digestion, but ginger is one of the best. Very good anti-nausea and just to help ease the digestive tract. Ginger tea, ginger cap capsules, whatever way you want to take it. And the final one I'm going to talk about is bitters. And bitters have been used by herbalists for many, many years. And they're based on a concept where most of the poisons out in nature are very bitter. Right? We don't like bitter, and it's for a reason. It's for our survival, because most of the time poisons are very bitter. Now, our body knows this. So when we taste something bitter, our body ramps up all of our digestive processes to try to deal with it as quick as possible and to neutralize the poison. So we can actually consume certain herbs that taste bitter, that aren't harmful to us, to ramp up our digestion. And one of the classic sort of combinations is Swedish bitters. We also know of Canadian bitters. Canadian? Yeah, there's Canadian bitters as well, some combinations. So what we want to do is, one of the takeaway messages here is we want to take our time, sit down, digest our meal, not get disturbed by external um, stimulus, and really, um, you know, the meal time is very sacred, and digestion is where everything begins. It's where everything ends, right? Um, and what I'd like you to maybe do is everyone has a sheet with those ways we can improve digestion and either just mentally or with your pen choose one item that you might want to do for the next week because uh, with my clients especially I'm all about action you know it's one thing to hear about the information but if we don't take a step today we're not really going to do it. So maybe just choose one. It all starts with one thing, one change, and then maybe commit to doing that for the next week. And I say that knowledge is power, but applied knowledge is even more power. If we don't apply it, it's not worth anything. So with that, I want to thank you for coming here on a Saturday afternoon.